Welcome back, guys, to the JPS Podcast. And in this episode of the podcast, I'm honored to have Greg Knuckles back on the show. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about the fundamentals of the scientific method and how you can become more science literate and read a study, specifically how to objectively evaluate research. So we start on this paper level as Greg runs through how he disseminates research and basically his step-by-step process for reading a research paper and what he does at mass. We then expand on how to review the total body of literature and we also cover some of the unethical research practices and factors that you need to consider when you're looking into reading scientific literature which is really really important and all of the things that you need to consider before trusting a study and letting it influence your decision making as an evidence-based practitioner. I'm really confident that you guys will take a lot out of this episode and it will help you become a better, more critical thinker and learner, especially as it relates to the scientific research. So without further ado, I present to you Greg Knuckles. Yes, now, uh, yeah, we're going to be talking about uh, science literacy and I guess the fundamentals of the scientific method. And I thought we would start on the very uh, broad level of, you know, what is the objective with science and, and what are we trying to achieve, you know, in scientific research as it relates to exercise science? Um, so, so different sciences have different overall aims um but for the most part what you're trying to do is uh ascertain generalizable knowledge um so you're trying to uh collect information as rigorously and reliably as possible uh typically in the form of data um and you ideally want um the conclusions of your experiment to generalize beyond like just the sample of people Um, in your experiment. So ultimately, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to contribute to generalizable knowledge to to make our society just a little bit smarter. Awesome, awesome. And in in terms of reading a study, we want people and practitioners to be able to objectively evaluate research. So at the level of a, a research paper, you know, one of the primary things you guys do at Mass is you break down a single study and review it. So for those individuals out there who are aiming to be a little bit more evidence informed and they want to start getting into reading papers and not just research reviews, what factors should they consider when looking to do so? And you know, what are the things they need to develop in terms of their scientific literacy uh, skill set? Uh, man, so I think the main thing Um, And I think the main thing that separates me from, like, myself from five years ago or me from, um, like, not necessarily, like, scientists, but people kind of in the online evidence-based community is, like, what I look for when I read a paper. Mm -hmm. Uh, So kind of of a meme out there is, uh, ah, these people, like, they're just skimming abstracts and dumping PubMed abstracts into arguments to try to get the upper hand. Uh, And that's like super common. Like I think a lot of people really do just not read past the abstract. Um, And there are some journals where you can get statistics on like um, the number of times that an article has been accessed on the journal site versus like how many times the full text has been downloaded. Um, And like, you know, you might see like the article, like people have looked at the abstract uh, just on the journal site, not even on PubMed. Uh, like 1500 times in the full text has like 30 downloads or something. So th- that's like super common. Um, then I think when people uh, move past that point and start reading full texts, they kind of stick to the exciting bits. Um, so they, you know, they'll read the intro, um, kind of skim the method section, skim the stats section. Um, the results section, sometimes it's clear, sometimes there's, it's just mostly like reporting outcomes of statistical tests. Often they'll go and, you know, look for tables and graphs and figures. Um, and then they'll read the discussion and that's largely what they base their opinion of the paper on. Um, 
I'm kind of the opposite. <laughs> so uh, I I generally like at best skim the intro um, and really focus on like the last paragraph of the intro because that's generally where like research questions and hypotheses are stated. And, and so this this is just like if I'm reading papers for fun. So if it's reviewing something for mass, like I'm reading every single part in depth word for word. Um, you know, if there's like 30 papers that I want to read through, generally like I skip most of the intro, skip to like the last paragraph of the intro, read that to see like, okay, what was their actual hypothesis and research question? Uh, then read the methods in a lot of detail, read the stats section in a lot of detail, and then read the results section in a lot of detail, and then typically just kind of skim the discussion section as well. Um, because ultimately, ultimately what it comes down to is like, did they, did they have like a decent research question and hypothesis? Uh, were the methods they used adequate to answer that research question? And then what was the answer to that research question? So that's like, you know, end of introduction, methods, results. Um, and then kind of within that, uh, did they use valid and reliable assessments for, you know, whatever measures they were taking? Did they use appropriate statistical procedures? Um, and then past that, like, the, the reason that I don't tend to take too much time reading intros and discussions is oftentimes they just kind of turn into editorials. Um, like the intro is is kind of to show the rationale for asking the research question and doing the study in the first place. Uh, and then discussion sections, like talking to a lot of researchers, I think one of the things they have an issue with is like draconian word counts. Uh, and they wish that they could write really in-depth discussions that bring in a, like the vast majority of the previous literature addressing similar questions and getting into mechanisms a lot more. Um, but like oftentimes journal word counts just don't really allow for that. Um, so, so oftentimes discussion sections are pretty inadequate and really just kind of an editorial. Um, and oftentimes state, state like conclusions and takeaways that are a lot more than can actually be drawn, uh, from the data and results themselves. Um, so yeah, ultimately like I, the, the meat of the paper is the part that most people skim over. Like, is it a good research question? Are the methods appropriate for answering that research question? And then, you know, what did they actually find? What are the results of the statistical tests? Did they use the proper statistical test and did they interpret them correctly? Um, so yeah, when, when I dig into a paper, that's generally the approach that I take. Um, if, if again, I'm just kind of reading a bunch of papers, uh, if it's something that like I'm reviewing for mass or something related to my thesis that I need to know really, really well, you know, then I'll spend some more time on the intro and spend some more time on the discussion section. Um, make sure that the sources that they're citing to back up their claims for their rationale in the intro and then kind of contextualizing their results in the discussion, like make sure that those citations are proper citations and actually saying what the authors say that they're saying, because um, that doesn't always happen. <laughs> uh, yeah, and um, and then even going beyond that sometimes. So again, one of the issues with discussions is oftentimes like you're, you're limited by word count um, and there may be 30 relevant papers in a particular area and the discussion only allows the authors to really compare their results to maybe four or five previous papers. Um, and so if it's something that I really need to know inside and out, once I actually read the paper itself and kind of get an understanding of like how that study was conducted and what it found, then I do my own literature search and pull up 30 other papers to compare methods and results to. Um, cause ultimately like one paper in isolation is useful, but, but you know, you shouldn't put all of your eggs in that basket. Um, so oftentimes like really trying to understand the results of one paper kind of involves reading 20 other papers as well. Um, so yeah, so basic version, don't just stop at the abstract, pull up the full text. If you're going to focus on, 
one part of the full text, stick with the meat of the article, which is methods and results. Um, and then, yeah, if, if you're going to really dive into an article, um, you know, you might see it's eight, 10 pages long. Don't think that that means, ah, yeah, I'm going to get through this in 15 minutes. Like to really, to really get into enough like background to fully understand what it is, assuming it's not something that's like squarely within your area of expertise where like you'll know all of the literature off the top of your head. Um, you know, one paper might be like a three, four, three, four hour undertaking. Awesome. Awesome. And there's a lot of things that I sort of want to pick apart there, but you know, you mentioned that one paper doesn't, you know, give you that much insight into, you know, what's actually going on. You need to look at the entire body of literature, but within that single paper, you know, some, you know, within science, we don't want to think categorically that, you know, there's good science and bad science, you know, it's incremental. Some is just better than others. Um, and some, ha some papers have more explanatory power. Yeah. So replication, <laughs> like study design controls, like okay. the duration, okay. isolating independent, dependent variables, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so a um, couple just general things to look for is um, I think the first the first thing is just to make sure that the 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 study res study design and results match the conclusions that the authors try to draw from the article. Um, so something really common that you'll see um, is like maybe in a training study, there's two groups and you're assessing strength pre and post and you're trying to see if one group improved more than the other. Um, and typically, the statistical procedure you'd use to analyze data like that is called an ANOVA, an analysis of variance. Um, when you run an ANOVA, the statistical output will give you um, three different things. So it'll tell you if, so that, that would be, you're looking at differences between groups and differences between time points. Um, and ultimately what you're interested in in that type of design is a group by time interaction. So from pre to post was the change in one group different than the change in the other group. Um, and oftentimes what you'll see with that type of design is uh, the authors will report a main effect for time, which basically means just both groups improve or like overall when pooling all of the subjects, they improve pre to post. Uh, they might detect a main effect for group meaning that when pooling pre and post time points in both groups, one of them kind of tended to be better than the other, but then they won't detect a group by time interaction, um, which is ultimate, which is ultimately like what would say, you know, were these changes different between groups or they'll detect like a main effect of time in one group and not the other to say like, Oh, this group improved, but the other one didn't. But ultimately like, to say that there was a difference in the changes between groups, you're looking for that group by time interaction and then uh, a significant effect in like a post hoc test. Like typically in our field, we use either Bonfroni or Tukey, uh, but there are several other. But so that's what you're looking for. Um, and oftentimes, you know, authors will say like there was a significant improvement in group A, but not group B. Therefore, A is better than B for whatever. Um, but ultimately like you can't draw that inference from, from the results of the tests that they ran. Um, so the first thing I look for is just basic stuff like that. Um, was the experimental design proper and then are they drawing the correct conclusions from the actual results that they got? Um, next thing I look for is, uh, is typically like what, and, and this is kind of a subjective assessment, but what is the risk of bias affecting the results. Um, and so I think when people think of bias, the first thing, the first place their brain goes to um, is, is there any sort of like funding conflict of interest? So, you know, is it a supplement study funded by a company that has stake in this particular supplement? Um, and that's certainly worth looking for. But I think there are other forms of conflicts of interest um, and potential sources of bias that often don't go discussed as often. So I, I think people can absolutely have intellectual conflicts of interest as well. So maybe you're not monetarily benefiting from getting a particular result, but you know, you've done like five studies in a particular area and they all came to similar results. 
and you spent like the last 10 years of your life, um, you know, kind of putting forth a particular theory or hypothesis, um, then, you know, it might be a little bit embarrassing if you get results that run counter to that. Um, so I think, I think that that's a potential source of bias as well. Um, so if there is a reason you believe uh, the researchers might have some form of bias um, for the particular thing they're researching, uh, next thing to look for is like what steps were taken to reduce the risk of bias. So um, randomizing everything is always good. So, you know, was there random group allocation if random group allocation is possible? Um, otherwise, you know, even inadvertently, you might kind of tip the scales. Um, like say you're doing an acute assessment of performance after taking a, a supplement or something. Uh, you know, you, you may kind of have a feel for the people who are better athletes um, than not in, in the subjects you're recruiting. Uh, and even if you don't mean to bias things like you you could potentially have bias in group allocation if that's not randomized um although i i think that's less common um blinding is also really important both blinding the subjects and blinding the researchers uh it's not always possible so for example like if you're running a training study um most of the time and specifically like resistance training stuff because most of the times, like our lab groups aren't that big. We don't have that much money. Um, and training studies take hundreds or thousands of hours to run. And so having someone blinded to do like pre and post training assessments would mean that that person could not help with any training visits because then they would potentially know group allocation. Um, so, and, and that depends. Like if it's a blinded supplement study, that person could, uh, like if, if you're blinded to who is in which experimental group, um, that's not as much of a concern, but like a training study, if there's like two different training programs, if you help out with the training, like, you know, that that individual you just trained was on a particular program. Um, so yeah, then it just kind of becomes an issue of logistics where if you do have someone blinded, that means, you know, that might mean like 30% more work for everyone else. Um, which oftentimes just isn't feasible. Um, but yeah, as often as possible, you want to, you want to make sure, um, that blinding is accomplished if blinding is feasible. Um, and then, and then just some, some other like kind of good practice things that you don't see all that often, um, but would be good if you did, uh, would be pre-registration. So, um, what pre-registration is is basically like you as the researcher publish somewhere beforehand, like on open science framework or, or something similar. Uh, here's the study I'm going to do. Here's how many people we're going to recruit. Here's what our methods are going to be. Here's how we're going to analyze the data. And then like you pre-register that protocol. And so when people read your study, they can refer back to the protocol you had pre-registered and see like, oh, they said they were going to do this. They did it exactly the way they said they were going to. There probably wasn't anything untoward that happened here. Um, otherwise, like, you know, y y you have some degrees of freedom in data collection and data analysis. And even if you're trying to be unbiased, um, you know, you might, you might try a test here or there that you wouldn't have otherwise tried if you had like told people beforehand what your data analysis plan was gonna look like. Um, so yeah, I think pre-registration, pre-registration is really, really common in other sciences. Um, so I think in like biomedical sciences, it's a requirement. Um, if, if it's not a requirement, it is still like super common. Um, it's becoming much more common in psychology. I, I can only think of like maybe half a dozen like strength or hypertrophy studies that I have read ever uh, that were based on pre-registered protocols. Um, so that's some, like that's a clear area of improvement where kind of like we as a community could, could improve. Um, that, you know, I don't think there are that many people intentionally doing stuff that's shady, but at the very least, like pre-registration, um, 
make sure you're not doing anything shady because like if you if what you do differs from what you pre-registered everyone's going to see it and be like oh this person's this person's messing around right here um and also it just helps other people have more confidence in your results um because they can see like oh they said they were going to do this this is exactly what they did i know they weren't fiddling around here um and then Let's see. Last thing that I personally look for is like for the significant results that they report. Um, what are the reported p values, and kind of what what potential ways could they have messed around with the data to get barely significant results? Um, so, like, not to bore the listeners too much, but p values are what you look for in inferential statistics to determine if something is quote unquote statistically significant or not. Um, and we tend to use a p-value threshold of 0.05 in exercise science. And the thing is like, if you want to fiddle, fiddle around with your data or fiddle, fiddle around with your analyses, um, it's not too hard to mess around in a data set and get a p-value of like barely below 0.05. Uh, it is really, really hard to take like a completely null data set and fiddle around with it to get a p-value of like less than 0.01. Um, so, you know, if if I'm reading the results of a paper um, and they get some significant results, but all of the p-values are like 0.049 or like 0.038 or something like that, like just barely significant. Um, that at the very least makes me a little bit more skeptical. So, uh, yeah, it was kind of rambly, but those, those are some of the things that I look for. Yeah. Awesome. And I guess one of the pinnacles of science is taking all of the available evidence and deriving theoretical directions from there. And this is what helps us design real world experiments and, you know, tease it all out. So when you're looking at the entire body of research, what are some things you're looking for more broadly if there is, you know, research that's conflicting one another or if, you know, for example, the latest study that Dr. Schoenfeld did, there was, you know, very much uh, an extreme, well, it actually wasn't because uh, I was speaking to Menno the other day and there was a similar uh, study in 2011, I think it was, that found similar or even greater results, but this uh, study happened... The the Ridelli paper? That's the one. Um, But yeah, everyone's sort of up in arms. And, you know, how do we make sense of, you know, this one paper in the grand scheme of things? And, you know, the recommendation for hypertrophy, you know, was 10 to 20, but now it's like, well, up to 45. So where does that sort of shift that general recommendation? (laughs) Yeah, man, so... uh, so if, if there are studies investigating like a similar research question that are coming to different results, um, first thing you should look for is like, where do the protocols differ, either in the populations used or in like in a training study, how long the study ran for um, or the training protocol used in the study and see if like, okay, based on, and, and typically, So I think that there should be more just like pure one-to-one replication papers. Um, Like that's, that's something that, uh, that theoretically science is supposed to be based on. Um, You know, you, you publish your protocol and uh, like, that's the point of a method section. So people like can replicate your work if they want to. Um, But like direct one-to-one replications are incredibly rare. Um, so I think there should be more of that, but uh, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon for reasons it's probably not worth rambling about right now. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so you, you tend to not see direct one-to-one replication, so there do tend to be differences between studies. Um, they use different populations, so maybe trained versus untrained subjects or young versus middle-aged subjects or male versus female subjects. Um, or there are differences in protocols. So um, this is something I ran into a lot uh, when I was reviewing the periodization literature a while back. Um, you know, there might be 20 papers looking at undulating periodization, but none of them use the exact same training plan. 
Um, so yeah, like they use different exercises, different total amounts of volume. Um, so like, you know, there, there are differences in the actual intervention applied. So, you know, I think, um, I think that those are the first things you should look at. Like what are, what are the actual differences between the studies beyond the results that could explain disparate findings? Um, the next thing I think you should probably look at is like kind of overall, like overall, if the results of a study are incorrect, um, do they seem like they might be incorrect to a degree that could be just simply be explained by sampling variation? And so what sampling variation is, is like, uh, okay, so if you want to know how tall the average man is, uh, and you draw a sample of 20 people from the broader population, uh, see how tall they are, and then um, use inferential statistics to, to try to estimate the, the height of the average man. Um, then you draw another sample of 20 people, do it again, draw another sample of 20 people, do it again. All of those estimates should hopefully be at least somewhat similar, um, but will clearly have some variation between them. Because you're not sampling the entire population, you're taking a sample from that population. Um, and so you expect some degree of variability just due to the fact that you're not taking generally a tremendously huge sample and just results can vary between samples that you're drawing from a population. Um, so yeah, like if results are, are not exactly like prior research, but aren't so dissimilar that, um, you know, that they're just completely out of left field, then, uh, you know, it, it could just be a matter of they drew an anomalous sample, which happens. Um, and then past that, like, things to look for are just general hallmarks of like, did the study seem to be conducted uh, appropriately or perhaps better than prior studies? So did it use a larger sample size? Um, maybe was this study blinded when prior ones weren't? Maybe was this study pre-registered when other ones weren't? Um, yeah, just kind of stuff like that. And sometimes uh, similar studies of similar quality come to completely different conclusions. And, uh, and that's just kind of the way life works. And that's why we have meta-analyses. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah. yeah. It, I, I find that more often than not, though, you don't have to move past that first step. Like, it, if, you, if you use different, like, slightly different methods on a slightly different population, you could get completely different results. Um, and so, like, if, if a paper is similar to prior research but differs like in those types of important ways. Um, like, using slightly different methods on a slightly different population. Um, so you wouldn't necessarily expect the results to be identical. If they're way, way different, then you know maybe that's worth looking into more. Um, but if they're still like somewhat similar, like you know, maybe like a significant result instead of like a null result versus like a significant result in one direction versus a significant result in the entire opposite direction. Like that's that's a gulf that there needs to be hopefully something else to explain. But if it's just like, yeah, small effect here, large effect here, or null effect here, small effect here, like, yeah, whatever. Like at the end of the day, like th that's the type of thing you should expect to see. Um, Oftentimes, like if I'm seeing a lot of papers coming to basically identical results, I get skeptical. Uh, like it kind of seems like a hurting effect at that point. And, you know, in terms of unethical research practices, uh, which is something that you wrote about in uh, Volume 2, Issue 10 of Mass, um, I actually wanted to do this podcast pre 
uh, that publication, but but here we are, and it's all good. And I guess for a lot of listeners who aren't already subscribed to Mass, there's actually a link in the description box below, so you guys can do that, which is Greg's uh, monthly application in Strength Sports, along with Eric Helms and Mike Zordos. Cheeky little plug. It's a really good resource uh, for anyone who's in the strength and physique game and wants to know more about the latest research pertaining to those areas. But Nonetheless, plugs aside, you discussed uh, unethical research practices and, you know, how uh, incorrect findings uh, can occur and whether or not we can predict uh, results of a study and whether they sound or not, all those sorts of things. And what really, really shocked me (laughs) when you wrote this, when I was reading it, I was like, holy shit, most published research findings are false and in projects designed to directly replicate landmark studies, replication rates of positive findings are below 50%. So that, like, when I read that, I was like, holy crap, like, <laughs> does science even science? Like, what, what's going on here? So I guess, uh, can you discuss some of the criteria that you use? You've sort of touched on it briefly uh, in a very, um, I guess, positive light uh, to predict the likelihood of findings uh, that are incorrect. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like, uh, the replication crisis. So, so this is, this is crazy to me because like people within the sciences generally started talking about this a lot, um, back in like the early 2010s or so, um, in some hypotheses that a lot of the published research might be wrong. Um, those started swirling around considerably considerably before that. Uh, so the paper you referenced, um, most published research findings are false by, uh, I've always pronounced his name John Ioannidis, but I recently heard his name is pronounced like Euondis or something like that. Like it's a Greek name and I don't speak Greek. Um, if memory serves, that paper's from like 2005 or 2007 or something like that. Um, and so that paper essentially, um, it's more of a modeling paper than anything. So it wasn't like going through thousands of research studies and like trying to replicate them and finding a dent. Um, it was more based on probability of like, hey, we're seeing a lot of barely significant p-values coming out of really large data sets that it would be really easy to find like tiny spurious relationships in. I bet a lot of this stuff is garbage. Like that, that's basically the thesis of that paper. Um, and then, you know, th- that if memory serves is the most read scientific paper of all time. Um, you can go on plus one wow. uh, and, and look at the read stats on it. I think it's been read close to 3 million times at this point. Um, so that's a really, really well-known paper. Uh, and when it came out, it was like really controversial. Um, and then, uh, a bunch of people in psychology, um, led by Brian Nosick, if memory serves, were like, okay, this is, this is a very audacious claim that most published research findings are false, uh, within our field. Let's see if that's actually true. Um, so like I mentioned, there, there tend to be very few direct replication attempts. Um, so these guys at the center for open science, what they said is like, okay, we're just going to try to replicate a bunch of landmark studies in psychology. Um, So they consulted with uh, research teams that had initially made like positive uh, groundbreaking landmark findings um, to get their input to replicate their methods as perfectly as possible and just re-ran like a whole bunch of really famous important psychology studies. Um, and so in terms of just like rates of replication in terms of like significant findings in the original paper versus significant findings in the replication attempt, I want to say something like something like 39% of them replicated, like less than half. Um, and the average effect size for the replication attempts was only about half as large, um, as the average effect size of the original publications. Uh, and more recently people have undertaken similar replication attempts, um, in like cancer trials, uh, and a couple other fields as well. And across the board, uh, 
uh, social sciences was one as well. That was that was recent. That uh, replication paper, or like mass replication paper, came out like last month, I think. Um, and yeah, so on the whole, like in in the fields that have tried to replicate a lot of landmark studies, um, they're finding that like yeah, somewhere in the neighborhood of of half of these things that we believe to be true uh, aren't replicating. Um, and so there are some things that can contribute to that. Uh, the biggest, the biggest two, I think, um, just based on kind of the incentive structure that they that they build, um, is publication bias and p hacking slash harking. So what publication bias is uh, and how it arises is basically like scientific journals are a business, um, and the publishers want to make money, and the publishers make a lot of money. Um, so Elsevier, which is the biggest scientific publisher in the world, uh, when last I checked had a larger profit margin than like Google and Apple, uh, like their profit margin is, is somewhere in the neighborhood of like 50%. It's ridiculous. Um, like they're just making money hand over fist. Uh, and so to make money, um, they have to sell journal subscriptions and people are going to be more likely to buy subscriptions. And by people, I mostly mean like academic institutions here. Um, if the journals are publishing stuff that is uh, viewed as exciting and important, and typically those are statistically significant positive findings. Um, there are situations where null findings are, are very sexy and exciting, but typically that's statistically significant positive findings. Um, and so, one, that leads to a disproportionate amount of the published literature ending up being false positives, even if everyone's doing everything right. Um, simply because, like, there will be some number of false positives that occur unless you set your alpha level, like, unbelievably low. Um, so, yeah, false positives are going to happen. But then if, like, all significant effects are getting published and, like, a disproportionately low amount of null findings are getting published, just a disproportionate amount of the literature is going to be composed of false positives in the first place, even if no one is doing anything sketchy along the way. Um, but then what that incentivizes, publication bias, um, is it incentivizes people to specifically look for positive statistically significant findings. And you can go about trying to get those findings in a variety of ways, some of which are ethical and some of which aren't. Um, so an ethical way to go about trying to find significant findings is just to try to tip the scale in your experimental design. So uh, for example, if you're, uh, if you wanna show that like beta alanine is beneficial for hypertrophy or strength gains, we know that beta alanine uh, increases muscle carnosine levels, carnosine is a buffer, um, and so beta alanine supplementation aids in performance for things that are me metabolically stressful and likely to be um, constrained and limited by metabolic acidosis. So if you're designing a study to show that beta alanine can be beneficial for strength or hypertrophy, um, you know, you, you'd specifically make a training program that's going to be really metabolically stressful, like maybe high reps, short rest intervals, stuff like that. Um, so then the people taking beta alanine, theoretically, that should help their performance, like in each acute exercise session. And so then hopefully they'll they'll make larger gains throughout the course of the study. Um, so yeah, you can, and that's perfectly legitimate. Like as long as you're transparent about your methodology and research design, like you can design studies specifically to get positive effects that may limit how generalizable they are to day-to-day -to -day practice but there's nothing particularly sketchy about doing that. Um, what is also fairly common though, and much more ethically dubious, uh, are techniques uh, typically known as p-hacking and harking, um, which fall kind of under the umbrella of data dredging, uh, just a bunch of buzzwords coming your way. So p-hacking describes uh, methods of getting statistically significant results from data sets where your original analyses didn't produce significant results. Um, and harking, which is a close cousin, hark, H-A-R-K, stands for hypothesizing after results are known. Um, 
And so to hark, and harking is kind of like a subset of p-hacking. Uh, what you would do if you were harking a paper is like you would run you would run an experiment, just collect as many variables as possible, as much data as you possibly can. Um, just look through it and try to find significant results. Uh, and then when you write your paper, whatever you found that was significant, write your paper as if that is what you were looking for. Um, so a really good example of this is uh, there was there were a couple people who wanted to show kind of how easy it was to do that. Um, and they ran a study where they wanted to show that chocolate did something beneficial for health. And so they had uh, one group of people not eat chocolate and one group of people eat like one like tiny little dark chocolate bar uh, per evening for like two months or something. Um, had a small sample size, so just, you know, hopefully going to get a noisier data set. And they took like 40 different measures of health, everything from blood lipids to fasting blood glucose to weight to several other things. Um, and they found that when using univariate statistical analysis, uh, the group that ate chocolate tended to uh, lose more weight over the course of the study. And I think maybe had larger reductions in systolic blood pressure, something like that. Um, and so when they wrote the paper, they said, hey, we set out to see if chocolate helps people lose weight and it, if it lowers their blood pressure. Not mentioning, yeah, we also took blood lipids and fasting blood glucose and like 50 other things. The media um, would absolutely have a field day with that one. They did absolutely have a field day with it. So so this was recent. This was like 2013, 2014. Um, and there were like 30 or 40 like major media outlets that when that study came out, they're like, yes, eat chocolate. It's the best thing ever. Uh, and then the people who were running the sting operation were like, psych, we duped you. And it was really easy because a lot of people do this. Um, so that's harking. Basically collecting enough data that you're going to find something significant, possibly by chance alone, and then just crafting your paper as if those significant findings were what you were looking for in the first place. Um, P-hacking P -hacking is sketchier than that. Um, in that typically it involves like kind of untoward manipulations of your data, um, or just like completely wrong statistical analyses. So for example, um, if, if you're collecting five variables at two different time points or something, uh, the way you should analyze those is a five by two ANOVA with like five levels of the variables and then two levels of time. Um, and what an ANOVA will do is basically it will keep your, your false positive risk for the entire statistical test for all of these potential relationships you could look at, at whatever your predefined alpha level is. So what, whatever that p-value you're looking for is. Um, so basically like it just helps keep your false positive risk from, from elevating too much. Uh, a much more liberal approach to analyzing that data would just be to run um, uh, a t-test for every single variable from pre to post. Um, for each one of those t-tests, your false positive rate or your false positive risk will be 5%. So if you're running five of them, then suddenly your false positive risk for the entire experiment goes from 5% to 25%. Um, and, you know, often just because risk of false positives are higher, you're going to wind up with at least one false positive. Um, that's kind of like p-hacking for beginners. Uh, then if you want to get uh, more sketchy about it, um, and this, this happens from time to time, uh, you get your data set, maybe it's a training study, and you see that for the most part, people in group A are getting better results than the people in group B, but one or two people in group B got really, really good results. Um, then you might think like, well, those guys were outliers. So let's just exclude them, run the analyses again, and then see if our data is significant. Um, and people do that. Uh, and oftentimes there's not enough transparency to know that people did that. Um, or more often it kind of works in the opposite direction. Like one group will tend to do a lot better than the other, or tend to do better than the other. 
you run the original analyses, get a p-value of like 0.07 and say, oh, that's no good. It's not quite low enough. Well, you know, I seem to remember that Johnny here, subject number six, he may have had some sniffles when we did post-testing. Uh, and coincidentally, he didn't get great results from this training program. I think we can can reasonably exclude him from analyses because there's that mitigating factor. He may have been a little sick. Who knows? Um, and then you run it again and, oh, p-value of 0.046 now. Okay, we're golden. Um, you know, not saying that type of thing is super rampant, but it definitely happens. Like, I know of distinct cases of that happening. Um, a little bit less egregious than that is running a bunch of permutations of different statistical tests until you um, get significant outcomes. So uh, I know one way that, that a lot of people will mess around is uh, I mentioned ANOVAs before, analysis of variance. Um, a similar statistical test is called an ANCOVA, an analysis of covariance. And so with an ANCOVA, like the nuts and bolts of it are, are similar, but basically- These are very exotic names for all these statistical procedures. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying not to dwell on, on the super nerdy stuff too much. Um, but yeah, so with an ANCOVA, you just co-vary for some sort of baseline characteristic. That might be strength, it might be muscle size, it might be age, it might be training experience, like anything you have data for, you can potentially co-vary for. Uh, and so if you just run your raw analyses with an ANOVA and find that you don't get significant results, like you can just try co-varying for like 15 different things until you finally find um, like a combination of covariates that gives you like barely significant results. Um, so that's, that's another method of p-hacking. Uh, that's not an exhaustive list by any means. Um, but yeah, like people, people do do that stuff. Like it's hard to know exactly how common it is and how many researchers have built careers off of stuff like that. Um, I, I like to think that it's not incredibly common, but I definitely know that it happens. Um, and I think that, you know, ultimately, I think culpability lies on the individual, but I think that publication bias is largely what drives that behavior. Because, like, if there's not an arbitrary p-value that you know you have to shoot for for your results to be publishable, or at least publishable in, like, a high-impact journal, um, then you're not going to feel like you kind of have to do this stuff, or at least it won't be incentivized. Um so yeah, ultimately, I think that publication bias largely sets that incentive structure to do sketchy things with data to try to get significant results. Um, and in a perfect world, people would behave ethically and not respond to that perverse incentive. But in the real world, um, I don't know how many people do, but it's it's more than a few. Awesome, man. That was, uh, yeah, very, very thorough. And I guess... It almost seems for people who, you know, are wanting to be more evidence-based that what's the point? We, we don't even know if this stuff is, is right. We don't know, you know, whether people are doing shady things. So what should they make of all of all of this? Like, you know, it seems very much doom and gloom. So what should the average practitioner who's not directly involved in, you know, contributing to the science, you know, in these kind of ways, but they're just digesting it and trying to make sense of it all, what, sh what should they do with all of this information? That's a good question. Um, so yeah, I think that, uh, so sometimes when I talk about stuff like this, I'll get pushback from like quote unquote evidence-based people. Uh, Cause they're like, look, like we're, we're trying to sell people on science is good and important and you should pay attention to it. So like, don't you dare come in and say like, ah, sometimes it's sketchy. Uh, and like, yeah, I, I, I do recognize that talking about this uh, very well may be working against my own best interests. Um, because ultimately, I do think that science is good and valuable and people should pay more attention to it and put more stock in it. Um, but I think that it's also important. Um, I just think it's important to know what's going on. Um, and I think that if you are confident in what you're saying and what you believe, uh, you should be able to present the entire picture without having to like selectively filter what you tell people. Um, 
you know, it's a great story to tell people uh, scientists are all thorough and they're controlling everything and everything that gets published is pristine and you should put all of your faith in science because of that. Like that, that's a really good story to be able to tell people. And I really wish I could, but, but ethically I, I don't, I wouldn't feel comfortable doing so. Um, and I think that in spite of its flaws, science is still valuable. Uh, so the thing is like, ultimately, ultimately science is a self-correcting process. Um, and the thing with like error rates in initial publications, like that just means that there is more stuff to be corrected. Um, but ultimately like that, like true progress can be made, true knowledge can be gleaned. Um, and after years and decades of work, you know, the true stuff eventually wins out and the stuff that may have like mistakenly gotten into publication, either just because it was straight up false positive and no one did anything wrong, or it just got in because people were being sketchy. Like eventually that stuff will get rooted out because science has mechanisms to self-correct, um, which makes it unique uh, as far as I'm aware among methods of accruing knowledge and accruing information. Um, so science is certainly imperfect. And I think science is more imperfect than a lot of people realize. Uh, that's or it, like not the scientific process, but the way it's often practiced. Uh, and that's kind of the whole point of this podcast. Like that's the point I'm making. It, here. It's the people um, who make it imperfect, not necessarily the science itself. Would that be correct? Correct. Correct. Um, and so, yeah, it's an imperfect process uh, carried out by imperfect people. Um, but for my money, I don't know of a better process in existence. Um, so I think that ultimately, ultimately, I think what we should be doing is is taking what we have, um, looking for some of those things I talked about earlier in the podcast that uh, can help you get a general idea of, of what studies and what results are more likely to be um, good and reliable. Um, and then advocate for good practices to make the process better. So, um, can we go there next? <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so something, and, and so I mentioned before that it stuns me that a lot of people don't even know that the replication crisis exists, um, just cause people in health and fitness aren't talking about it. Something else that a lot of people don't realize exists are what are called, uh, registered reports. So registered reports are very similar to pre-registration in that like you're telling people beforehand, here's what I'm going to do. Here's how I'm going to collect my data. Here's how I'm going to analyze it. Um, but registered reports take it a step further where essentially what you do is you submit to a journal. Um, here's, here's how I'm going to run. Like you're basically submitting everything to a journal for a paper, except for the results section. Uh, well, the results and discussion, because obviously you can't yet discuss results you don't have yet. Um, but you, like it's intro, methods, statistical analyses, you submit that to the journal. Um, and basically, if the journal accepts it, they're saying like, yes, based on what you've told us, uh, your, your hypothesis, like what you want to research is something that's going to be useful and valuable to the scientific community. And the methods you've described that you're going to use are um, adequate and valid for investigating this hypothesis. So we will accept this paper regardless of what the results are. So then that takes publication bias out of it because the journal has already said, regardless of what you find, we say that this is a good experiment, so we're gonna publish it. Uh, like, regardless of what the results are, they're going to be valuable. If they're null results, they're valuable. If they're significant results, they're valuable. This is an experiment that that is good and you should do it and we'll publish it. Um, and so that also takes the incentive for p-hacking off the table and it takes the ability to p-hack off the table. Uh, not entirely, but largely because like as the researcher, you've already been told by the journal, whatever you find, we're going to publish it. So you don't have to do anything sketchy to the data to get it published. You've already been told it's going to get published. Um, and so like, Man, for the life of me, I cannot figure out. Well, never mind. I was I was about to be naive. 
Um, I think that if science, I think if the publication system ran on registered reports instead of scientists doing complete experiments, writing up results, and then submitting to journals, I think if it worked the other way around, like getting it accepted to a journal before you even do the experiment, um, just based on the strength of your hypothesis and experimental design, I think that that would, it wouldn't fix everything, but I think that would be an enormous step forward. Um, just because a lot of the things I, I, a lot of the sketchy things people do that I've been talking about, like they just have no reason to do it anymore because, uh, you know, their papers would get published. That would help their careers and life goes on. Everyone's happy. Uh, the reason I think that doesn't happen, again, the cynic in me, uh, is I think that the journals don't want to do it because then uh, they're not going to to be able to guarantee that they're going to be publishing a lot of significant, exciting results uh, so the papers may get cited less and that hurts their impact factor and that hurts their income. And like, man, ultimately, I think that, and this is, this is, this is another podcast for another day. I think the entire scientific publishing industry is just absolutely crooked. Um, and, and, and that's not about the scientists. That's about the publishers. Like, I think that that is ultimately the root of most of the evil uh, I think it's the whole system is absolutely ridiculous and deeply unethical. Um, but yeah, I think that, that if there could be like a movement to really push for registered reports, uh, and that be the standard model of publication, I think that would improve things tremendously. Yes. It sounds like where ethics and money are involved, the truth is harder to find. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not going to argue with that. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, man, that was uh, absolutely brilliant. And hopefully the guys have got a much better insight into how to be more scientifically literate and be able to disseminate and digest a lot of the uh, information online uh, as it relates to research papers and the like. So, man, thank you very much for the time. I will make sure that I link uh, Mass in the description box below along with Greg's website and everything else that he does uh, online so that you can follow him and get lots more knowledge bombs like he did today. So thank you very much, Greg, and we'll speak to you next yeah, time. Yeah, thanks for having me on.